if you're not sure what room you're in, this is the 107 room. We're talking about web accessibility. Um, let's see. I guess the, we'll start off with the too long, didn't read the post type, uh, you know, um, summary. Uh, accessibility is just not not just about screen readers. There's a lot more to accessibility than just you know how how blind people can read your website. Uh, it's not just a I guess a set of simple rules, or maybe hey, it's somewhat it is, but it's not something that I'd say you can easily test and say, is this accessible or not? Because we can use so many different tools and um, tools and systems to design and build websites that uh, I think the only, you know, to some extent, you just have to understand the accessibility stuff uh, well, or, you know, understand the rules, and then also, uh, yeah, and then, and then also maybe even have someone who has some accessibility <laughs> limitations test it out and give you some feedback. Uh, yeah, it, along the same lines, there's a lot of it, different ways to, or many interpretations on how to implement it. I don't think everyone agrees that, you know, this is accessible or this is not. Um, and because there's many different reasons that things could be accessible or not. And so we're going to give, today gives you some ideas for how to build accessible websites and things to look for. Um, I guess uh, about me, my name is Dan Ficker. I work here as a web developer at August Ash in Bloomington. And I've been a web developer for over 10 years now. Uh, yeah, I've been using Drupal for at least six years or so. I've heard of Drupal so longer than that. I think my Drupal.org user name is like over 11 years old now, which is surprising. <laughs> but uh, let's see. Yeah, my Twitter handle is Delirious Guy. Um, that has to do with a Christian rock band from 15 years ago, um, or maybe my state of mind. I don't know. Uh, so that yeah, that's about me. Uh, I did I did actually tweet uh, a PDF of all the slides. So if you want to follow along. Feel free to look that up. So what is web accessibility and what does it mean? We'll just jump right in here. I guess if you do have questions, feel free to just kind of shout them out or something. Um, disability. Uh, yeah, basically, to some extent, one in five people, 20% of people are disabled in, in some fashion. It's not something that you could, you know, for not everyone, it's not something you can see right off the bat. You know, it's... Um, it, it could take many different forms. Uh, here we got a picture of uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, who's he's not blind and he he just can't move <laughs> like most of us do and um, you know move his muscles. But he's a really smart guy, and so um, you know I think all he can really do is kind of move a little joystick around or something. And how do you build something that's easy for him to use? Uh, I mean I don't know if you want to you know build your whole website accessibility around just that one case, but hopefully we can come up with some, you know, tools that kind of keep those types of things in mind. Um, yeah, and just, uh, yeah, disabilities vary the amount of forms and the, you might not know the person's disabled. Um, personally, I'm a little disabled too. Uh, can't see that well. I tried to get a good photo here a couple days ago of me just looking at my phone really, really close. Whenever I see photos of me looking at my phone really close, uh, I'm like, oh, I look like a dork. But it's like, oh, I got to read my phone. And that that's what basically my disability is. I, It's some sort of a genetic hello. Hello. thing. Hello? That's weird. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. Uh, my, my, yeah, I have a kind of a genetic disability. And so I, 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 I cannot see that well. Yeah, so yeah. and. Basically, I've I've never been so you know my my eye condition has been the same for most of my life. So I, I've never learned like braille or how to use a cane or anything like that. But I just generally have to get a lot closer than most people to see things, and uh, it's it's not really a huge problem. Um, well, the only thing I don't do, I guess, is I don't drive a car. Um, according to my eye doctor, with my glasses I can see well enough 
to get a license in Wisconsin, but not Minnesota. And like for me, that's just more of enough of like, I'm just not going to deal with it. So, um, what, what I guess I like, I feel like I can see pretty well. I do bike around town a little bit, and um, what I do notice is like if you're driving on the freeway at 50, 60 miles an hour. I can't read the sign until just about as soon as we passed it. So <laughs> that would definitely not be good anyway. Um, but yeah, I, one thing I noticed, uh, especially with websites in the past, uh, seven, eight years ago, before kind of responsive design was a big thing, people were designing for really high resolution screens because all the designers love you know, having lots of space. And so sometimes I would have it on my computer running a low kind of 1024 by 768 resolution and you know it's like I have to scroll off to the side of the page to see the right sidebar or something like that and thankfully I think with people using more cell phones and more uh, yeah more cell phones and more, and more mobile devices that those design things have not really become as much of an issue um, because they're just designing Thing for any size screen instead of you know the common desktop screen so yeah website accessibility what is it again uh, website features should be usable by anyone uh, and build your site with common disabilities in mind um, the good news is that web standards are a great start and that web standards just say you know have actual nice markup that's that's recognized by all browsers and recognized by all systems, uh, or you know as many browsers as possible. Um, and also, good news is that Drupal is very accessible. Drupal Core, especially, um, you know, I think on all or almost all Drupal Core development and some other development too, there is actually like accessibility uh, layer that has to pass. Like somebody has to explicitly test the patch for accessibility and give some feedback. Um, yeah, and I, like I said before, the bad news is kind of I haven't, you know, the, uh, I think there probably, there are definitely tools for checking for accessibility, but kind of like even if you're che checking, you know, that if your your standards compliant, you just you know use the W3C, you know, HTML checker, uh, it'll often kind of identify things that are maybe maybe not a problem and. Uh, the, I think you know accessibility is kind of like that too. It's like maybe look for this, but it's it. I think there's no easy test that can say for sure where things are accessible. And also, actually, in the newest standards too, you can only really say it was accessible at this time because as you add content, content administrators and that that, that type of thing uh, could be doing something as well to make it not accessible. And so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, right here, we'll get to standards. What are the different standards? This is just a general web uh, web standard, HTML5. Um, yeah, and just a good standard for building a website that will be recognized by all kinds of browsers, all kinds of machines. Uh, so screen readers for the blind and um, actually Todd, in the last session I was in, Todd from Four Kitchens was saying, Screen readers are not just for blind people anymore. He's like, your phone can read, can read off a web page for you if you're in the car, or you know, and you, your Mac can do that as well if you want. Um, I don't think too many people use it yet, but it might become more and more popular. But yeah, HTML5 is how web browsers function, and uh, it's a standard so that everyone will have the same experience no matter what kind of browser you're using. Um, yeah, this is not generally an accessibility standard, but it's just a basic standard of building websites. And it's good, good to be keep it in mind. This is definitely a, a the U.S. government st standard, section 508. Um, I'm not exactly sure exactly how this relates to the American with Disabilities Act, but it's it's America's Disabilities Act, yeah. Um, but it, it's required for all government agencies, including schools, the hospitals, I think, and. Um, or at least government-run agencies like that. Um, so there's definitely people who are very interested in making sure that this happens. Uh, yeah, and they, it's a, it's mostly about content for your website, making sure that it's readable by screen readers and other assistive technologies. 
Um, I have a quote from the Section 508 website, I think. Accessible sites offer significant advantages that go beyond access. For example, those with text-only options provide a faster downloading alternative. And that's something I think is nice and important, too. It's Sometimes it might not even be about accessibility. It's just, you know, uh, there's a 30-minute video here, and I'd rather not watch the video. I'd rather just scroll through a transcript and read it. And it takes me a couple minutes less to read it than watch the video, potentially. Um, and it's it makes your site more accessible to have both a video and a transcript of the video. Um, and it's not just for blind people or people who can't hear. It's also just for anybody who wants to see that or you know interact with that content without actually sitting there and watching a video. Uh, yeah, and the this official accessibility standard from the same people who make the HTML5 specification is called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I don't know if you call that WCAG or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, and Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 is the current version. Um, I was actually reading through recently a book about this and what it means. And it's very interesting because they've tried to make it as technology agnostic as possible. So it doesn't say like you can use these HTML tags or these you know, these not don't use these HTML tags. It's more even about you know if you're having an interface that is supposed to do this, make sure it doesn't allow or let's see. Yeah, there's even some stuff about if you're playing video, don't you don't have or have a sufficient, sufficient showing text in a video or a picture, make sure you have sufficient contrast in there and don't make the video have flashing or at least you know make sure that you can somehow turn that off if, if needed and it's just because you know, some people uh, can't handle you know flashing things uh, <laughs> and you don't want to have that on your website it's, or another one was too if, if your website or any sort of system starts to play audio right as you go to the site it should be made just for a couple seconds or it should be something that they can easily turn off right at the top of the page um, because some people, well, sometimes it's even me, for me, I'm like, I already listened to music in the, in the background and I don't want to have some other music playing on top of it too, so. Uh, let's see, yeah, this again is also mostly about content of your website. Um, it offers some good ideas too if your content is a very, very long piece of content, try to like a Wikipedia article or a, you know, this accessibility guidelines document, you know, maybe have it all on one page, but also give like a table of contents so people can easily navigate through through the documents. And from what I understand, the WCAG 2.0 does include pretty much everything and more than Section 508. So, um, you know, some people who know a little bit more about accessibility, say just try to, you know, get get kind of to this accessibility standard and you already have, you know, uh, accomplished basically the U.S.'s standards as well. Yeah, um, I mentioned that too, yeah, they're testable statements that are not technology specific. Um, but I think they still have to be tested by humans. I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's too many ways to automate that testing. Uh, another specification from the World Wide Web Consortium (W3C) is ARIA, uh, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and this really has to do with more than just a content-based website, an interactive application or a website. And this is, you know, I think a good example is something like. Gmail or, you know, um, and I don't know too much about the accessibility of Gmail and they might serve up a whole different kind of, you know, separate version for that or they might have an accessibility, you know, in mind. But, yeah, so, so when you have kind of, I think you, you also have to keep this in mind for websites where you have a kind of complicated user interface where it's not just, you know, a couple links in a menu and uh, just a basic form. Uh, if you have kind of more interactive 
fun things, you have you should keep this in mind so that you, basically Aria is a bunch of kind of specific tags that screen readers and other systems do use to say this is this type of interface and this is how you should understand it and and use it. And yeah, exactly when you have more complicated forms menu JavaScript, and th this is this is what you'd have to look at for that standard. Yeah. The, the, yeah, this is just a standard that almost all these assistive technologies, it be it a screen reader or uh, some people will use like a, a braille terminal that will print up or print out the braille on there or yeah, any any sort of assistive util utility. Um, implementing accessibility. I found some code on the internet, so there's a picture. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. Hey, this is a kind of about how one implements accessibility into a website. Um, one way to do that is to have an accessibility expert that looks through your website. Um, and generally, the way this usually happens is at the end of building a site, someone, uh, the accessibility expert, will get hired to come in and take a look at the website, uh, maybe offer some changes. Um, the the problem is that sometimes this gets taken out of the project just because there's not enough time in the budget of the project to to you know or yeah we say we went over on a couple other things and we don't really have time to worry about accessibility. Um, also, thing things can get caught at that point by the by accessibility experts or someone who's looking for accessibility. Uh, but it could be so built into the design of the website that uh, it's, there's not much you can do about it anymore, or it's going to require you to have to re reformat a lot of the website or rebuild some things. And so generally, yeah, fundamental issues to the website could not be fixed at this point, um, which is not a good thing. Um, what, I, what I'd recommend is really that we keep accessibility um, I didn't mention that, but sometimes accessibility is abbreviated to A11Y, which is, it starts with the letter A and then 11 characters and the letter Y uh, is the word accessibility. But the idea is throughout access or to have your whole web development team and even the owner of the business and the author of the content actually understand accessibility and understand what they need to know about making sure their website is accessible. Um, this is this can, definitely can be a little bit of a daunting task because it's, you know, I was thinking about it and I was like, well, we need to train everyone at August Ash to make sure that they know exactly how all kinds of accessibility things go, and that doesn't sound like a, a very simple, quick change. But uh, you know, I think it's it's something that's worth worth doing, especially, but. Um, the other good, the other, on the other hand, it's maybe not the training is not that hard. It, most of it is just understanding and following web best practices and standards uh, because if you make it so that, you know, it works well in all different browsers, uh, generally, you know, uh, generally the information is going to be accessible as well. Uh, and then, you know, most of the concepts are just, are not something that's that hard to understand. It's just something you have to be aware of. Uh, and we'll come, we'll get to some examples of that a little further. Um, yeah, just make sure all of the stakeholders of the website, like I mentioned on the last screen, are really aware of all the different pitfalls that they, in their specific role, may Come, may run into. And then hopefully you can catch the issues before they happen and you don't have to end up with an inaccessible website that's not easy to fix at the end. And then yeah, everything, every accessibility is built in to the whole project. And we're going to look at some common pitfalls. I thought that was a pretty funny photo I found on the internet. It's apparently a handicapped accessible, but an accessible spot, but 
apparently you're also not supposed to have a van there, so it's maybe not accessible. Um, let's see, yeah, so here's a couple different pitfalls or things to watch out for uh, when, when building a website, uh, is that the contrast should be should should be at a high level. Uh, I guess it says three to one contrast for text on the background, uh, and that's you know this is just again it's not about you know a person using a screen reader because that this is not a problem, but it can be just someone who can't see that well or can't determine colors that well. Uh, you want to make sure that the text is readable. Um, I know, yeah, this. Uh, Sometimes websites also have you know links that just kind of look like the rest of the content. Maybe only have just a slight difference in color. Uh, they should be more prominently distinguishable, if possible. Um, I'd say generally most websites have an underline on the link, which is a good indicator to people that it is a link. But uh, but, but you know, also have a color that is visually distinguishable, and then yeah, the link should also, I think, have an underline because, or or something else to determine, like hey, this is a link. Um, I think there's a, still a lot of freedom in your designing CSS with that, but uh, it's generally a good idea so that people can say, oh, I can click there. Uh, Another important one is to make sure that color is not the only distinguishable factor, and that actually relates to the link. That's why I say you should probably have an underline, is because if it so some people can't see different colors that well, and um, actually I'll, later in the there I'll have a link to somebody's made a plugin that you can just run on your Mac that actually you know kind of simulates what a colorblind person may see, and so you can actually say like oh yeah they, they can't actually tell the difference between that color and this other color, um, and, and that's one of the reasons that you don't want to color to be the only distinguishable factor. Um, yeah, and then you know yeah some of these web content accessibility guidelines things are just like hey the text should be readable and you know that's something that I think people know, but they sometimes don't think about as well. And I think you also have to keep in mind too that just because you can read it doesn't mean that it's very, very readable. Uh, that someone else may not be able to read it as well. Let's. Yeah, um, this is one I, I think is also important too. Um, not everyone is looking at the website with exactly the same tools you're using. Um, it, the screen readers, to some extent, do see the website in kind of a little bit of a degraded state. I mean, it still shows up on the screen that way, but um, you want to actually have the content in a nice order, and you want it to... like. It should be somewhat readable, even without the CSS. And that, or if you don't have JavaScript enabled, that it should be s still usable. Uh, and these are things that you know I try to do in my developer work too. Is I generally actually try to make a web page that actually works without any JavaScript, and then after that, even maybe add some layers of JavaScript to make the functionality more enhanced. But at this, the, the point you at least know that the JavaScript, or that that JavaScript is not a necessity for running your website, um, and that's not. It can't be that case all the time. Um, and if you don't, you know, if you need JavaScript on the website, give a nice message and maybe say even why. But yeah, content should be in the order that it shows up on the page. Um, if you. If you have you know a link that says log in, and then it pops up a login thing, um, it makes sense to actually have that content for the screen reader right there next to login, instead of you know in the footer or header of the page, because then you know the uh, the user may actually click on login but not actually see what what the you know or not actually be able to perceive where the 
the content changed on the website. Uh, yeah. If oh yeah, and then yeah, like I said earlier too, if you're using Flash or video, any other sort of add-ons, uh, extensions that maybe not everyone has, uh, try to offer some sort of a, you know, a, a, a system to, or some sort of a, a version of that content that everyone does have. So again, a text only, like a text transcript of a video or a description of what what is available there if, if you did have this available. Also, there's, there's a whole group of people who don't really use the mouse or the touchpad or their touch screen that well. And so there's, it's good to keep that in mind as well, uh, that they may actually be using the tab key to actually kind of, or, or some other keys to, it, it depends on slightly on some browsers and what kind of, what kind of uh, add-ons they have for their browser. But if you, you know, it, that they should be able to use a tab key or some other key to kind of step through the links on the website and then hit enter on the one that they want. And if, if they're looking at the website visually, they should be able to see what item, which link their, the focus of the page is on. And sometimes we, uh, as website developers and designers, turn that off in a way that we don't even realize we're doing. Um, I think actually, from what I understand, some of the early kind of CSS reset things will even turn off some of the you know focus indicators. Generally, there's usually a blue or so outline on the focus indicator. But yeah, and yeah, keyboard. Yeah, also you can uh, provide to your users keyboard shortcuts for different links. You can you know say this is a there, there's HTML tags to a link to say you know th this could also be triggered by Control K or Control C or that or or not Control maybe it's Option or Alt depending on what your browser is. But there is a way to say you know this link is always or th this link on this page is associated with this key combination. Yeah, and then also, uh, especially with add-ons like Flash and those type of things, sometimes when you tab into those, uh, they have their own systems for kind of, you know, using that tab key to actually uh, navigate within the Flash thing. But generally, it also doesn't let you get out of there too. So if you wanna, if you are using those types of systems, and or you can also put in HTML tags to control how the tab key uh, order goes, but you want to make sure that they don't actually get trapped in a certain section of your website and not be able to navigate to other parts of your website. And we'll show a little bit of that too. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so actually this is an example on augustash.com. Uh, the light blue outline uh, do, is actually, if you're using this kind of tab navigation, keyword navigation, you get a, uh, this is a very, very much the default, uh, you do get a kind of, a, a nice light blue outline, which is actually kind of a little hard to see on the screen because the background is blue, but um, it's at least better than nothing, hopefully. Uh, but I did actually, just for comparison, right a couple links over actually put what what the mouse over effect for that is which is a little bit more readable it makes the uh, text a little brighter and adds an underline so um, yeah yeah and again like I said some some CSS resets from the old days would actually get rid of that focus outline so you'd actually be navigating through the site on the keyboard with the tab key or other key combinations and not actually be able to see what you're currently focused on, uh, which, which is definitely not helpful for those who would like to use that. And I, you know, I would assume that someone might just not go to your website after they're like, oh, I can't figure out how to use it. So 
Um, that's, I think, what we want to make sure doesn't happen is, you know, that people will be able to look through your website and understand and use it. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Another couple things to keep in mind is have to do with forms. Um, I don't know if you do. I, I often do when navigating through a form, actually click the tab key and go to the next form field. And that, that it can be helpful instead of uh, actually having to click on the next form field with your mouse or something like that. Uh, but a couple other things that can be helpful as well is uh, just to make sure that the form actually is discernible from the rest of your website. Sometimes you'll see a form where they don't really have any edges on the fields or they don't really have a, a really, like sometimes I have, I have really subtle labels or kind of call out text that are generally just too much of a light gray on a white or something like that. So it's not really easy to see like, oh, there is a form field here for those who can't, you know, see that well or, uh, yeah. It, that that's a, a big part of it. Is just make sure that uh, I think I've also seen some too where the uh, there's no actual labels on the form fields and only just in that kind of suggestion text that goes away once you start typing in it. Uh, do you actually see any any or do, do you actually? So after I start typing on the field, it's like wait, what was I typing about? And I don't even know. Uh, what this field's actually asking me for. And you'd have to kind of clear out the text and hopefully hope that little text will come back to say, oh, yeah, I was supposed to type my email address in here, not not my name. But uh, so that's why I think it just can really generally be useful for anyone just to have a nice label that's above or below the field, um, maybe next to the field as well. Um, yeah. and. That's that's most of it, I think. Uh, and you, you'll, I think, now that you now that you mentioned it, you'll probably see a lot of websites where you're like, oh, uh, it's it's hard to tell maybe that this is actually a form field or that the label or what the label is. Uh, a couple more points about accessibility. Drupal is accessible, which is a good thing. And like I said, uh, here's just a couple examples, I guess, of of things that I are not really. You know, really hardcore accessibility features, but are are nice, um, and and things that Drupal has built into it, and you can actually use on your own websites uh, in the front end or back end by implementing some Drupal code. Uh, so right here we have a little screenshot of the menu section of the page, and uh, what what I'm mostly looking at is right in, in this corner here. You have, or right on the left side, you have. Uh, the draggable uh, menu items. You can control what the order of the menu is through the draggable items, um, which is really nice and handy when you have a mouse. But if you don't have a mouse, it can be <laughs> not so useful. Um, and the nice thing is that Drupal does is it only has this up when you have JavaScript on, and it also even has an option to turn it off. Right up the top right of the table, it just says hide, hide row weights. And when you do that, you actually get something like this, where the draggable items have gone away. And, uh, this is what you also get if you have no JavaScript turned on. Draggable items have gone away, and it's been, been replaced with a column that says wait. And so uh, you know, if you don't have the option of dragging it around, you do at least have the option to you know, change the number that's associated with those, and then hit save, and then you will be ordering, changing the order of the menu items. Uh, another option of this type of accessible user interface um, is right now in the C Tools module, I believe. Um, but I'm actually looking at this operations link over on the right. The most common operation that you want to do on a view is edit the view. And so that option shows up right away. But there's also a little small arrow next to it that you click on and you get a menu that drops down with a number of different operations. This one doesn't have an option to turn it off if you don't have JavaScript. And I think it's written in such a way that you know, screen readers do understand you know, what those links are and 
you know, will, will if you click on that little arrow and say expand, it will actually show you the other options. But even if you turn off JavaScript, you actually get the full list right there. Um, so, so that you have all the operations available. Um, it just kind of tidies up the interface a little bit more to have not so many options there because there are a lot of options. There's, what is it? There's five, edit, delete, disable, clone, export, yeah. So uh, it's, it's nice just because in some cases you might be a little overwhelmed by all the options. But uh, this, this, let's see, I think, you know, some accessible users may want to just have all those options right there. Um, and it's only, you know, it, 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 it kind of, on the other hand, it cleans up the interface for most of us who are looking at it just in usual website. And then, yeah, so the, these, in, these tools and others are code that you can use on your website for your administrative interface or even your front end interface. Um, another couple other things that Drupal provides for accessibility. Um, they do provide a, a class, element-invisible, which basically positions the element off the screen, but is in a way that screen readers do know how to read that. Um, another thing that I didn't know until recently was that screen readers do not read display none. So uh, it's, it's, you don't want to use the display none style if you want it to be read, read by uh, screen readers or other assistive devices. And, and assuming that you also don't want it to show up for for, for uh, general users as well. So, uh, yeah. And then another thing that Drupal can do that's nice is uh, on to make sure your content is accessible for images and other things the alt tags or title tags can definitely be helpful uh, if an image is not, uh, or if you cannot read an image, a screen reader cannot read an image, uh, you in the alt tag should include some sort of text that says, you know, this is what this image would tell you if you could see it. Um, and basically, the nice thing about that too is within Drupal's user interface, when you upload an image, you are asked if you want to put an alt text in there. Um, and maybe with a little bit of code modifications or maybe even built into Drupal, you could actually say the alt text is required in this type of case, uh, which would make sure that you know the, the people who are administering the content are not just leaving it empty and uh, therefore making your website inaccessible to those who are using screen readers or some similar technology. Um, so I think that's one thing I think is really nice about Drupal is that the administrative systems are pretty much as, as extendable and um, modifiable as the front end to some extent, especially if you know a little bit of PHP. But, uh, and, and so then you can, you know, do some more things to, in your specific case, you know, enforce that the content is accessible as, as much as you possibly can. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? Apparently I'm mostly done here, so that's that's good. Um, let's see, yeah, uh, this was just a special thanks to, I saw uh, Bill Tyler, the local man who does uh, who does web accessibility testing and uh, Stuff he, he spoke at Mini Bar a couple months ago, and that's kind of what got me thinking. Like, oh, I should research more about accessibility and present about it. Uh, and then also, I did talk to a DrupalCon, a group of Lullabot folks, uh, Chris and Helena, and who are talking about accessibility as well. And uh, they call themselves the Accessibots, and are also kind of working to make sure that. Uh, Accessibility is important to the web developer community. And uh, that's really all I have as far as a presentation. I'm definitely open to putting questions. I do have a couple more resources here, actually, too. Uh, there's some interesting, I think the Wave tool is, I think, some sort of a screen reader thing, or maybe it's a testing thing. I don't remember exactly. But Color Oracle is a plugin for your. 
Mac or Windows machine that can actually, like I said, I, I believe, uh, will will kind of simulate some different types of color blindness. Um, it's it's good for testing your design to say, you know, can actually some people who do have different types of site issues actually see the the, the difference in user interface on my website. Uh, Quail is also a JavaScript testing framework, uh, and it works with this Drupal accessibility module that only has a, I think, a dev version. But it, it's some sort of uh, JavaScript uh, JavaScript library that actually tries to do some automated testing of your website to verify that it is accessible. And yeah, I did look at this ebook as well. Um, WCAG2 Made Easy, and it kind of goes through all of the different web content accessibility guidelines 2.0 kind of criteria and explain those in a little bit more of a readable format. I don't know if you've ever tried to read W3C standards or docu documents. They read like a very fun, uh, well, like most fun, very specifications are usually not that exciting to read. This is a not too exciting either, but at least I think it tries to explain them in a little bit more uh, boiled down plain English. But any questions? I don't know. Yeah, I'm still kind of, you know, obviously getting into accessibility, and I'm not I'm by no means an expert, but I just wanted to kind of explain or, you know, uh, share what, at least what I've, what I understand at this point, and uh, hope, to, hope to learn more about it as well, but. Um, have you used the accessibility module? Uh, I have not, actually, no. I, I believe it does use this Quail JS library to, uh, again, I think try to, you know, add, uh, add some, you know, do, do some testing of your website to make sure that it is, uh, accessible as well, so. But I, I'm not. I haven't really looked into it a ton. No. Well, we have about 15 minutes left. But if nobody has any questions, then I think maybe there's even cookies and coffee out there early. <laughs> You're welcome.